Good evening from New York. I am Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. Thank you for tuning in. Those of you who are familiar with me, it will come as no surprise that I have decided to celebrate Women's History Month by inviting only women to appear on the show for the month of March. I do this because I have been raised by some very powerful women. And I do this in honor of them, but not only the women who raised me and have helped to shape who I have become today, but the women who are now in my life as friends and who I have the privilege of call angels. When I think of women, I think of nurturers. I think of leaders. I think of courage and strength. And, and as I'm saying this, I am conjuring up my, my mom and my grandmother and the women who have taught me in schools. So tonight, there is such a woman as our guest. Her name is Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver. Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver is a phenomenal woman, an exceptional leadership strategist, diversity expert, and author of the forthcoming book, How Exceptional Black Women Lead. She recently served as the youngest top executive officer of a major national membership organization, reaching 4 million women in the US and around the world, and is currently the founding president and CEO of Insight Unlimited, a top Washington DC consulting firm, which regularly engages with the White House, as well as key leaders and organizations in the US and around the globe. She's also the founder of the Exceptional Leadership Institute for Women, where she helps dedicated and highly capable women pierce through gender or cultural barriers in order to move further, faster, for, sorry, in order to move further, faster in their professions or in business while also building a home life that they love. I will leave it there for a moment, take a short break. We are back with <laughs> the wonderful Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver. Dr. De Weaver, good evening and welcome to CWS Journeys. Good evening, glad to be here. Behind the accomplishments, awards and titles, how, how would you describe this woman we have come to know as Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver? Ah, uh, deep down inside, I'm still a country girl. Uh, I hail from Southern Virginia. I know the feeling of you know, the hot summer sun against my neck out in tobacco fields. And I know the feel of the cool mush of mud, which I used to love. Mud pies was kind of my favorite thing to do in the afternoons. Uh, and so though I've been fortunate enough to travel the world with what I do and doing what I love, I'm still that little country girl from Southern Virginia. And if you were not doing what you do today, what would, would you like to have tried as a career? Hmm. Uh, the only other career I seriously considered was to be a civil rights attorney. So it's kind of close. Uh, <laughs> I um, had uh, actually finished graduate undergrad and applied to a few law schools, applied to one graduate school, got into law school, but with no money, <laughs> got full ride to uh, graduate school. And so initially I said, oh, I'll go and get my master's degree and then reapply to law school since, you know, it was free. <laughs> and I was hoping maybe next time around I'd get some scholarship money. Um, but after I got my master's, I 
decided just to keep going in that direction. So uh, that's how I ended up uh, in the career trajectory that I ultimately took. But had I not been here, I probably would have been a lawyer. So you kept going after one accomplishment and the other. You kept going. What do you believe it is in you that kept pushing you towards, you know, finally your PhD and where you are today? Mm -hmm. um, I have a love of learning. Uh, my mom was a teacher. She taught for over 30 years. Uh, and I I'm just one of those people who I, I love, love, love to learn, even to this day, even though I have, you know, a terminal degree, I still uh, explore new things. I still love to learn new things, develop new skills. I still grow in different directions. And in my current life today, I explore that through my entrepreneurial pursuits, which is always sort of a learning experience. Um, but I love that. And so it's funny because, um, you know, my family for a while, they didn't really quite know what I was doing. <laughs> they thought like when I was in graduate school, my dad kept asking me, so when are you going to finish with law school? And I was like, I'm not in law school. <laughs> so they didn't really quite get, I guess, what a PhD was. Um, but but I, I, I love it. Um, I, I've, I, but my career is very interesting, has taken different ins and outs. Because when I first uh, was completing my PhD, the initial plan was to be a college professor. And I did do that for a couple of years. I got a tenure track position and ended up teaching. But I missed sort of the uh, sort of the rubber to the road experience of really engaging in the policy world. See, I was spoiled and got my, my PhD at the University of Maryland. And so that got me the opportunity to be basically right here in DC and get the, the real experience as a political science in working in politics. So while I was getting my degree, I was already working at think tanks and already interacting with uh, congressional members and with people uh, in politics. And uh, in terms of leaving all of that to go and talk about it, I really missed it. So I had to get back to DC and that's ultimately what I did. So um, it's very funny. My, my career has evolved in a number of different ways from a professor to, you know, working at a for-profit firm to working at a nonprofit and now working as an entrepreneur. But in each and every iteration, I've always focused on issues of race, issues of gender, issues of justice. It's always provided me the opportunity to express my passion in some way. And uh, it's just a part of my DNA. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. You know, I, one of the things I like to do during these conversations is to, well, I believe that each person, each of us, is a, is, is a sort of a gem with many facets. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, people only get a glimpse of maybe one or two, and they form an opinion. So what yeah. I like to do is to twist the gem a little bit and expose the various facets. So. In so doing, I would like to go into your early timeline and ask you, what was it like growing up at the age of nine and 16? Ah, wow. Well, uh, in the earlier years, I just had just such a, a wonderful and amazing childhood. I grew up with uh, my parents and my grandmother. Um, we all lived together in her family home. And so it was a very interesting period. My parents had me when they were a little bit older. They were in their 40s. Uh, my mother was 40 when she had me. Uh, and so uh, they were well into their careers by the time I came along. And so while my, my mom and dad were at work, I formed this really, really super, super close relationship with, with my grandmother. So so much so that I call her mom and call my real mom, other mom. And so I really grew up in a very loving home, a loving home that was filled with not just two, but three amazing adults who poured their all into me. And I, and I think flourished as a result of that. In terms of the 16 year old me, and you know, I think it's not too different from most teenagers <laughs> back in the day. You go through this period of, you know, who am I? Where am I? Where do I come from? You know, that sort of moment of self-discovery. Uh, back in the time when I grew up, I was completely enthralled with Prince, and I still am, quite frankly. Still love myself some Prince. I, so, uh, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, sorry. At that time, I had a dual love. Still always loved politics, always loved social justice, but also was very into music at that time. Uh, so did a lot of um, musical activities. Uh, and really had a moment to sort of explore who I was. No, no real, you know, super um, 
you know, embarrassing moments in my teenage years, but I think sort of the normal sort of period of self-discovery that most teenagers go through. So who would you say you became at 21? Um, so what was your question? Where, what about 21? Yeah. Who, who would you say you became at 21? Then? Ah, at 21, um, let's see, I'm finishing up college. Uh, college was an amazing experience for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually went to the school that my, grand, that my mother graduated from in 1950. Uh, that was Virginia State University. I had an amazing time at VSU, love VSU, continue to love VSU. Uh, plan to send my older son there uh, next year. Uh, and so VSU was such an uh, affirming experience for me. It just really built on the foundation that my parents provided. Being a historically black college, uh, it was a safe space. It was a space where the professors really cared about whether or not you understood the material. It was, a, it was a space where your culture was valued and affirmed and where you could develop great lifelong friendships and where you didn't really have to put up with a lot of the other mess that unfortunately many of us have to put up with when we go to sort of um, other universities. Uh, you could just really focus on learning and it was a place of high expectations and a place where you left exceedingly prepared and confident that you could do what you wanted to do. In fact, I was so prepared, well prepared uh, upon obtaining my degree from VSU uh, that a book that we had used, I think when I was a junior um, in, at VSU, ended up uh, having to read the very same book <clears throat> my first year in graduate school. So, and I had already, you know, had the experience of doing original research as an undergraduate when a lot of the people that I was in graduate school with had never done that. Uh, and so I left Virginia State really confident, um, knowing who I was, or at least a, a facet of who I was as a woman at that point. But I think really prepared well uh, for the direction that I wanted to go in in life. And, you know, and I think that that was just really the best thing to set me up for success as an adult. You mentioned your grandmother earlier and your mom, of course, but, of course, but what is your favorite memory of these women who have made an impact on you? Uh, my, greatest, my greatest memory of my grandmother and my greatest uh, admiration point of my mother, who I'm fortunate enough to still have in my life to this day, uh, is their strength. I mean, these were and are fighters. Um, you know, I describe them as female Nat Turners. Uh, my, my grandmother and my mom are the real deal. <laughs> <laughs> they are the real deal. They have no problem in getting folks straight. Um, but what I love most about them is that they had the strong pride in not only themselves as individuals, but us as a people. And they instilled that pride in me. And they told me all sorts of amazing stories as I was growing up around the challenges that they faced and how they were able to very, um, to, to in a very you know skillful way, navigate those challenges growing up in Jim Crow South and my grandmother growing up even before that, you know, just a, just a very, very um, brutal time in this nation's history. And to do so in such a way that they were still able to succeed in spite of it all. It's just absolutely amazing. Let me give you one really small example. So as I mentioned, uh, my parents uh, growing up in Jim Crow South in Southern uh, Virginia, uh, during that period of time of segregated schooling, not only was were the actual schools segregated, which most people, you know, realize, um, but when you really deconstruct what that means in terms of the practicalities of the day-to-day -day experience, that meant, for example, that uh, white children got school buses and black children didn't. So black children literally had to walk to school for miles each and every day, back and forth, you know, while white ch white children are riding on school buses waving and taunting them as they drive by. Well, my grandparents uh, weren't too happy with that scenario. And so what they ended up doing was um, pulling together other black parents from the community and they pooled their money and they bought a bus. And then they took time and, and took turns driving that bus and driving their children back and forth to school every day. And so that's just one of the many examples uh, of things that I know that my family were very critical in doing uh, to create a situation out of uh, great devastation, potential devastation, but to turn it around and show some creativity, show ingenuity, uh, show strength, and actually 
move forward in a direction that would improve the lives of their children. And ultimately, all of those decisions that they made, I know, trickle down to benefit me. And I'm just clearly beneficial for that. Determination, innovation, strength, courage. Your father, your mother, your grandmother. Yes. Yeah, amazing. These, these, <laughs> let, me see how to, let me see how to phrase this question here. Um, what char whose characteristics can you identify when you're being or doing what? Ha, ah, okay. So if I am uh, engaged in a debate on a policy issue, um, that's, I'm definitely conjuring up uh, Ada, who is my grandmother, <laughs> if it gets super heated. Uh, and if it gets somewhat heated, I'm, 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 I'm conjuring up my mom. Uh, those two are, as I mentioned, just born fighters. Um, very, very sharp wit, very, very skillful in their oratory, um, just um, extremely logical in their approach to developing and, and, um, and laying out an argument. And so I think that skill really comes from them. Uh, also being on the receiving end of that as a child, I learned a lot. <laughs> And, and, but in terms of my ability to, you know, walk into a room of stranger, strangers and leave with a room full of friends, that comes from my father. Uh, my father has a, he really a very keen sense of emotional intelligence. He was um, also my, my sort of entrepreneurial spirit comes from my father. He's a very successful entrepreneur, uh, had to be. Uh, 14 years old when his father died and being the oldest son of eight children, he was charged with the responsibility at that age to take care of his family and his mother. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, he made the decision, being a sharecropper as a child, that he didn't want to grow up and work for a white person anymore. Uh, so he decided he wanted to work for himself and he developed several businesses. The main business that he had by the time I came along was a uh, lumber company that was very successful. He employed all of his brothers, employed other people from the community, uh, took care of his mother for the rest of her life, uh, cutting her a check every week that he cut a check for his employees. Uh, and so he was very uh, high character, uh, responsible, family devoted man. But I think one of the reasons why his business was so successful was not just because he had a good work that work ethic, it wasn't just because he just had a good entrepreneurial sense. It was also because he understood how to relate to people. He was able to have the right relationships to build the right um, business partnerships. And so that uh, sense of emotional intelligence uh, is the other side that I think that I get from him. And I think together, it really, really helps to create um, a good mesh that helps me be able to be successful in what I do. So when did you start start this journey on women empowerment? Oh God, probably when I was a kid and I was complaining about how come we have all these women up in church pulling into their purses every Sunday, but a woman can't sit in the pulpit. <laughs> mm. Wow. Yeah, wow. I was going for the, I was going for the gusto even as a kid. Did anybody ever answer that question while you were still a kid? Uh, you know, they, they, they tried to justify it. They could tell that I wasn't uh, happy with that answer. Uh, and I will say I raised a ruckus and, um, I don't know that I'm the main reason why, but they eventually got rid of that policy. I will say that I am the reason why for another thing that I did at, at my father's church, my parents went to different churches as long story behind that. But, uh, I was complaining about the fact that, you know, as black people, we're probably the only people on earth that kneel to something and some a deity that doesn't look like us. So um, to this day, there's no picture of a white Jesus in my dad's church. <laughs> it's directly related to me as a child. <laughs> I do know that one. Uh, so yeah, I don't know where, it's just always been there. I've always had a big mouth, I've always been an advocate around something. And when I saw, when I would see something that I thought just was unjust, uh, you know, I was, I, I spoke up and luckily I didn't have parents, parents that snuffed that out of me. Mm. I had parents that encouraged that and I thank them for that. You founded Exceptional Leadership Institute for Women. Yes. What led you in that direction? 
Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm so excited about uh, this particular um, direction. Uh, I founded that because, as you know, I've spent most of my life really working on big picture stuff, working in the policy world, uh, really seeking to change public policy to expand opportunities for women and people of color. And while I think that's critical, it's very important. It's definitely necessary when you live within a society that has spent centuries um, oppressing people and oftentimes using the government to do that. It's necessary to roll things back and change laws to create, to right that wrong. But unfortunately, while it's necessary, it's not sufficient, right? Uh, once you do change the laws, the laws on the books, there are still things that happen that might be legal but they don't necessarily result in opportunity exactly opening up for all of us in the way that we would hope that they do. There's still a lot of insider information, intelligence in a, in a word, uh, that doesn't really seep down in a, in a word, uh, that doesn't really seep down to us. Those top secret information that could mean the difference between being able to navigate successfully your career or being stuck in the same place for years and years and years while other people are propelled ahead of you. People that you train are propelled ahead of you. And so I really thought it was really important to focus not just on policy, but focus specifically on providing individuals with the key information that they need to create a more successful career, uh, whether or not they are a professional working in a corporation and a nonprofit, or um, to build a successful business so they can create their own economy more successful. Uh, and so what I did to sort of pull that together, it kind of spawned out of my research for my book. Uh, and working on this book, Exceptional Leadership, uh, How Exceptional Black Women Lead, I've interviewed well over 50 um, black women in corporate America, in nonprofit America, uh, elected officials, and successful entrepreneurs. And I've really sort of asked them, you know, what's your secret sauce? What's the secret? How did you navigate the challenges of not only gender, but race and gender and the intersection of the two on your way to exceptional success? And sort of, you know, being able to hear from them and get those secrets from them and get their techniques, I was able to sort of boil that down. And thinking about that also in the context of what I've learned throughout my journey and the various ways that I've sort of gone with my career, I've condensed that down and I thought, hey, I'm definitely writing this book, but I didn't think the book was enough. I wanted to be able to create an institution where I would specifically work with women on an individual basis or in a group coaching context so that they can get the information to really understand uh, how to move further, faster in their careers, but also do it in a way that they don't sacrifice their personal life in the process. So that's the, that's the sort of inspiration for that. Interesting that you mentioned um, your, your book, which I want to ask you about later, uh, How Exceptional Black Women Lead. What, as you were interviewing these women, what did you find, what did you discover that was common, discover that was common among, among those successful women? It, it's really to a person, to a person, they are doing what they love. They are exploring their passion. They are confident. They um, are very diligent. Uh, and they understand and they're very resilient, okay? So that if they have uh, had an experience or faced a roadblock, roadblock in one direction, they understand how to turn that around and use that experience as an asset to continue to propel them forward, maybe in another direction. Uh, so they are not weak of heart, um, but once again, confident, operating within their gifts and talents and abilities and you know they what they love to do their passion uh and uh being and, and are creative enough to go ahead and find a way to move forward even if they face challenges along the way what did you learn what did you learn about yourself during this research and after listening to these women i have to say i left each and every interview just inspired more and more in love with black women. I mean, I really do believe, you know, the phrase black girl magic, we got it. Whatever that is, we got it, okay? There, if you really think about, it, historically speaking, 
who is the mother of the earth, of all human beings on this earth? The oldest bones found on this planet were found in Africa. We are the mother of all that comes, right? We are innovative. We are creative. Uh, we are hardworking. Um, and oftentimes we're working. Um, and oftentimes we do so much and we do it so well that people just expect us to do and they keep piling it on us. <laughs> and oftentimes we just do because we can and we're so good at it. Uh, but the, the trick is to be able to benefit ourselves from our labor and not just allow other people to sort of use us to sort of piggyback, you know, leapfrog over us built on our labor. So what I left those, what I left those interviews with was this sense of really and truly how amazing and special we are. And uh, it just really just every every last one just made me more and more proud of being a black woman. You know, you believe that black women are magic, and I believe that too. And I don't know why your mother and your grandmother keep coming back to me, but I'm, so I'm going to be obedient to the spirits. Yeah. How would you describe their magic? Well, first starting with my grandmother, uh, just amazing woman. I mean, she could do, I don't think there was anything she couldn't do. I mean, she did men's work, quote unquote, and she did women's work, quote unquote, and she did it all well. Um, you know, I'll give you an ex a funny example in terms of, uh, quote unquote, men's work. As I mentioned, I, live, I lived in a rural uh, area. I can't even say in town, because I wasn't in town. <laughs> lived in a very rural area. And um, so it wasn't much excitement around there and nowhere near the big city. The big excitement every summer was when, you know, a, a snake would be found on our property. And my dad's reaction to that situation is that he would go and get his hunting rifle and shoot in the general direction of the snake until he finally hit the snake. And that would be how he would get rid of the snake. Not my grandmother. My grandmother would go to the shed get her garden hoe and cut the snake up into a million pieces. That's how she dealt with it. And so that is, <laughs> that's how my grandma was. It was like, she had no fear. She would do whatever she wanted to do and she did it well. And she, and, but beyond sort of that sort of funny example, she had this strength and dignity about her that was absolutely amazing. Just amazing. And I think about all that she must have seen in her lifetime and she had a dignity about her. And she did not want to be sort of called out her name or mistaken for something that she was. I'll give you another sort of very, very um, succinct example of that. Uh, my first day of school as a uh, kindergartner, it was really my first time being in a multiracial environment. And I noticed while I was there that the little white kids in my class had different color eyes. Some had blue eyes, some had green eyes, some had brown eyes, but I noticed that